Good morning, friends. Today we are indeed looking at this story from Luke. Um, my friend Clayton, he's a pastor up in Barry area. His church is going through the entire book of Luke, verse by verse. It's taking them like over a year. Um, and he preached on this passage and it really, really moved me. And so I'm very thankful to Clayton for sending me his comments about, about this passage to help guide me through it. This is an emotionally charged scene about a father and a son that follows an equally rich episode, the transfiguration, which is also an important conversation between another father and son. Peter and John and James have just witnessed Jesus speaking with Moses and Elijah. These disciples have just heard the voice of God speaking to their friend Jesus, saying, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. By this point, the disciples and the other followers of Jesus should get it, I think, right? This is Jesus. This Jesus is very special. He's the son of God, the beloved. He is a healer, a teacher, a new kind of king, the Messiah. Surely these things must be clear to the crowds. This father in our text this morning, he gets it. Let's put ourselves in his shoes for a moment. This father who loves his son deeply. This father who is distraught and probably exhausted from caring for his son. No, not again. Not again, God. Not another episode. Please, God, help my son. This father's mind races and his heart aches as his son slams to the ground. The boy's body shakes and twitches. He cries out in agony, his every cell racked with pain. Slowly the convulsions stop and the boy lies on the ground, too tired to move. The father and son are alone, exhausted, scared, tired and alone. No one wants to be around them. The boy whispers, Dad, please help me. This father's heart breaks again and again. His son has asked for help and healing repeatedly, and the father has not been able to help. As a parent, seeing our child in a pain, a pain that we cannot relieve is the worst. This is the story of the demon-possessed boy, or maybe better titled, the story of the desperate dad. The father in this story is indeed desperate, and distressed. After years of caring for his son, fighting this battle against evil, he has to be absolutely exhausted. Odds are he's had to save his son's life from all kinds of harm dozens of times. The family itself is probably having difficult times. Their neighbors, their extended family and friends won't come near them. It's like they're contagious. And this dad, He's running out of strength for this battle, but he keeps fighting because that's what dads do. They fight for their kids. And then he hears about a group of people following some guy from Nazareth. They're doing miracles. Rumors tell of scraps of food multiplying into feasts. Other rumors tell of miraculous healing, people seeing, walking, lepers being healed. And even more interesting, rumors of people whose lives have been taken over by the forces and spirits of evil, they've been set free and given back to their families. I think it's important here to note that every account of this story in the Bible, and even church tradition, states that this boy is experiencing demon possession. And as you look at the text, you might be inclined to think that this is a case of epilepsy. And the symptoms kind of look like it. But all our texts and gospel accounts, church history and tradition label it as the forces of evil wreaking havoc on a young boy. And that's exactly what's happening. And I want to be clear that people with epilepsy and other seizure disorders are not suffering from evil demon possession. That is an illness. But in this story, this boy, 
This boy is suffering. This boy and his father, this family is facing evil and they don't know what to do. So the desperate dad, with a hint of hope and a glimmer of gusto, he brings his son to the disciples of this rabbi. And it's likely no small feat bringing this boy anywhere. But desperate, time, de desperate times call for desperate measures. He begs them, begs them, something that in this honor and shame-based culture is seen as degrading. But dad doesn't care, dad is desperate. The disciples place their hands on this boy while he convulses, but nothing happens. For some reason, the disciples can't heal this boy. They can't free him. Mark chapter nine tells us the same story, and it gives us a bit of an idea as to why. Jesus tells them that this kind of scenario is only solved through prayer. Did the disciples forget to pray? I think there is a possibility that the desperate dad and the disciples make the mistake of thinking that they are going to solve this problem on their own power and ability. Instead of praying or asking God to do what he can through his power, they skip this important step of asking God to deal with this evil in the young boy. Instead, they try their hardest. They put all their efforts in and it comes to nothing. Have the disciples made the mistake of overestimating their own power or place in the world just because they are part of Jesus' inner circle? They're traveling with the Son of God. Surely that makes them special with access to special powers and gifts. This story is a cautionary tale. We cannot deal with the evil that exists in the world through our own power. We keep trying. In an age of individualism where we think we should depend on ourselves, this is a bitter pill to swallow. We call for peace, equality, and justice, or we think we can pull our bootstraps up just a little higher or work just a little harder. And all these actions are, of course, important. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers, and he calls us to go out and love our neighbors. But when we are faced with the weight of the problems created by evil in the world, we're overcome with feelings of inadequacy, panic, frustration, and perhaps like the father in this story, desperation. You've experienced the effects of sin, death and destruction in God's good world. We've seen what greed can do and how failing to care rightly for God's creation can lead to all kinds of scary things. You've possibly experienced moments of desperation like the desperate dad does, when it feels like you've tried everything, when it feels like you just can't march for justice one more time, when you just can't pull up those bootstraps any higher. You've also experienced or observed yourself or others placing trust in everything but Jesus in order to find solutions and defeat the evil in the world. People place their hopes and dreams in politicians only to be let down when they realize that they're simply human, just like the rest of us. We place our hopes in medicine only to realize there's not always a miracle cure. We place our hope in ourselves, thinking that because we work hard or live rightly or follow Jesus like the disciples, we have some special power to rely on. Sometimes we place our hope in educational systems, corrections, intervention programs, advocacy groups, and more, all of which have their appropriate place and role in society, but all fall short. This evil in the world can infect all the good systems in place that are supposed to help us. Schools, governments, the economy, social movements, these institutions are all important, vital even, but they are made up and run by humans. The world experiences evil. The Christian faith is pretty upfront about that, but it also presents a solution that the rest of the world and its systems do not. Jesus. 
Back to the desperate dad, he sees only one option. He has to get to this Jesus. He and his son are two people among a great crowd, all trying to catch a glimpse of the traveling, miracle-working rabbi named Jesus. This scene recalls the story of the hemorrhaging woman, whereas in her desperation, she reaches out and grabs Jesus' coat. Here, the father pushes and fights his way through the crowd. He's already thrown his dignity and honor away, begging the disciples. So he doesn't care what he's going to do next. He screams at the top of his lungs over the crowd. Teacher, I beg you, look at my son. He's just a child. <clears throat> he runs to the one who has the power and authority to make things change. He runs to the one who is known for defeating demons. I wonder how difficult this action was for the father. In order to truly help his son, he must abandon his own fatherly role of caretaker. He must relinquish any sense of power and give himself and his son over to Jesus. Jesus' response is unexpected, jarring even. It doesn't show us who he is speaking to. Is he speaking to the Father, the crowd, the disciples? But Jesus speaks out, calling the generation unbelieving and perverse. My translation uses the words faithless and crooked, which might be a better understanding. They've not believed in the power of Jesus and have strayed from trusting in God. They've misunderstood the power of the disciples and put their trust in Jesus' followers rather than in Jesus. The disciples have also strayed and placed faith in their own abilities rather than praying in God, praying to God and trusting in Jesus to deliver them from evil. So Jesus' words are a reprimand, a reminder. It is Jesus that delivers us from evil. Don't forget it. Jesus is here to make our crooked paths straight, and he is not messing around. Though his words are unexpected and may sound harsh, Jesus' actions are beautiful. He rebukes the spirit, he heals the boy, and gives him back to his father. And the text tells us that the crowd was overwhelmed by God's greatness. Today, in the face of evil, greed, hatred, and fear, the words and actions of Jesus in this story are both a reprimand and a reminder. Let us not forget who dealt with evil once and for all in his death and resurrection, Jesus. When he declares it is finished, he means it. Even further in his actions on the cross and resurrection, we see Jesus rebuke evil, heal people, and return them back to their Heavenly Father. He returns us to our Heavenly Father, just as he returned the boy to his desperate father. The ultimate solution to the problem of evil in the world is not systems, programs, and policies, all of which are important and have the potential for good. But the solution to the problem is found in the person of Jesus. And when the desperate dad realizes that, he does not care what anyone else thinks about him. All he cares is that Jesus can save his son. And Jesus responds to the desperate cry of the dad's heart and the desperate cry of our hearts. Deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. Amen. Today as we close, let us not forget the power of prayer, the way that desperate dad and the disciples did. Let us remind ourselves by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory.
forever and ever. Amen.